Good evening and first at five, another shakeup inside the Portland Thorns with the team firing its athletic trainer and one of its assistant coaches. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Molko. And I'm Laurel Porter. This is troubling news for a team that just won its third championship. Let's get right to Mike Benner outside Providence Park tonight. Mike, these firings stem from allegations of misconduct. Yeah, that's correct, Laurel. We are told that the assistant coach made unwanted advances on a player and the athletic trainer provided some players with a drug he should not have. In complicating matters, that athletic trainer is married to one of the team's top players. Just three months after netting this goal in the National Women's Soccer League semifinal game, Portland Thorns midfielder Crystal Dunn's husband and Thorns athletic trainer Pierre Soubrier is out of a job terminated by the soccer club. Investigators looking into allegations of misconduct found that Soubrier gave at least two players medication containing the controlled substance codeine. He did so multiple times and without a prescription and physician supervision, which is a violation of federal and state laws, not to mention league policy. But it doesn't end there. Also out of a job is Thorne's assistant coach, Sophie Clough, for making unwanted advances on a player. Investigators found that Clough kissed a player's neck at the team's championship celebration in Washington, D.C. These terminations would be concerning if they were isolated incidents, but sadly, they are not. Late last year, Thorns head coach Ryan Wilkinson resigned in the wake of a relationship with Thorns player Emily Mengis. Meg Linehan, senior writer for The Athletic, shared this with me at the time. The two of them did tell me we hung out one on one in three settings. They said, you know, as friends. And then by mid October, both said, you know, there was this expression of feelings via text messages. Those messages and emails showed the relationship between Wilkinson and Mengus never turned physical. So Wilkinson was cleared of violating any sort of policies. But it was evident she could not keep her job and she resigned. It came only one day after Thorns owner Merritt Polson announced he was selling the club. This was due in large part to a months long investigation that revealed a toxic culture of sexual, emotional and verbal abuse within the Thorns organization. The coach at that time, Paul Riley, was to blame for a lot of it. But the investigation also showed patterns of misconduct by Polson and front office staffers Gavin Wilkinson and Mike Golub, who were both relieved of their duties. Fast forward several months, and two more Thorn staffers are now unemployed. Assistant coach Sophie Clough and athletic trainer Pierre Soubrier. All right, back out here live. The Portland Thorns did release a statement saying they remain committed to following all NWSL policies. And that explains why they fully cooperated with the league's investigation into the trainer and assistant coach. The statement goes on to say the health and safety of the players is the club's utmost priority. Let's send it back to you. Thank you, Mike. Developing tonight, police say the man accused of shooting and killing three people in Yakima, Washington, has died by suicide. The shooting happened at a convenience store at about 3.30 this morning. Police say the suspect is 21-year-old Jared Haddock. Officers spent hours searching for him. They say they received a 911 call about the suspect this afternoon and heard gunshots as they approached the location. They found Haddock had shot himself. Paramedics tried to save him, but his injuries were too severe. Police originally said the early morning shooting was random, but now say it may have been targeted. Let's take you to California now, where people are reeling from three mass shootings in three days. At least 19 people have been killed and more than a dozen hurt. Here is the timeline. 11 people were killed in Monterey Park Saturday at a ballroom dance studio while celebrating the Lunar New Year. The shooter later killed himself. And Sunday in Oakland, eight people were shot, one of them fatally during an altercation at a gas station. And yesterday in the Bay Area, seven workers were murdered on two mushroom farms in the town of Half Moon Bay. That suspect is now in custody. We're just in absolute shock and disbelief um, that this occurred and our heart goes out to the victims and their families. To enjoy, to be family and then someone just come out of the blue and just destroy the whole thing. 
Well, investigators are not sure yet about the motives in any of the shootings, but say none appear to be hate crimes or acts of terror. And while the attacks in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay aren't connected, officials say they also have unique similarities. Both suspects are elderly Asian American men armed with semi-automatic handguns, and police add both killing sprees are likely fueled by a grudge or personal vendetta. The vast majority of the victims are Asian American. Oregon voters passed Measure 110 to help better fund drug treatment programs in Oregon. Recently, our Blair Best tagged along with one of the groups that received that money to see how it's being spent. Blair joins us now, and you found drug treatment outreach workers are still running into barriers when trying to get people into treatment, Blair. That's right, Laura. What we've learned is that getting people off the streets and into a detox or housing facility is a systemically difficult and lengthy process. We recently spent a day with an outreach worker in the Dalles who works at the nonprofit Bridges to Change. He described the system as one that's designed to fail. He connects homeless people to drug treatment services and navigates the many challenges that come with that. We saw some of those challenges firsthand, including the challenge of getting people referrals for a detox center. Now that process can often take weeks, even when people battling drug addiction can't wait that long. I feel like we've hit rock bottom and there's nothing left to do. If we don't get out, we're going to die. I'm just prepared to help the next person. So as soon as I'm done with helping one person, I'm ready to go out there and help the next person. Just to let them know that there is a change. Um, there's something better out there. A recent state audit of Measure 110 highlighted some of these problems. My full report with these outreach workers is coming up tonight on The Story at 6, just after nightly news. Really important story. Appreciate your follow-ups there, Blair. Let's talk about the murder trial of a suspected serial killer that's now underway in Clark County. Warren Forrest is already serving a life sentence for a murder back in the 1970s, and he is now on trial for killing a second young woman around the same time. 73-year-old Forrest is suspected in the abduction and killings of seven young women in Washington and Oregon, though detectives have not been able to link him to all of those crimes. He now faces first degree murder charges in the violent death of 17 year old Martha Morrison of Portland who disappeared in the summer of 74. Now Morrison's remains were finally identified in 2015 and shortly after prosecutors say DNA evidence from a dart gun belonging to Forrest was linked to Morrison. He followed a very specific plan, a plan that involved a very specific weapon and a very specific type of girl. It had a very familiar beginning, middle, and end. The state has not proven that he had the premeditated intent to kill uh, this individual. Opening statements there. The trial is expected to last for three weeks. Forrest is currently serving a life sentence in connection with the 1974 abduction and murder of Krista Blake, whose body was found buried near Battleground. The former mayor of Beaverton has been sentenced to six months in prison for possessing child pornography. Dennis Doyle pleaded guilty to one count in federal court last fall. The charge is from between November 2014 and December 2015. Investigators say that's when Doyle loaded the images containing child pornography, along with personal photographs, onto a USB drive. The sentence also includes five years supervised release and he'll need to pay $22,000 in restitution to the victims. Doyle had been the Beaverton mayor between 2009 and 2020. Well, an update on the city of Portland's strategy to combat gun violence with record homicides for the second straight year. You might remember last September, the mayor greenlit a plan to move forward with a somewhat controversial gunshot detection technology from a company that is called Shot Spotter. Now, investigative reporter Evan Watson is here. Evan, it sounds like the city is uh, taking a few steps back here. Yeah, David, city leaders are now asking competing companies to bid on how they'd manage gunshot detection in the city. It's still possible Portland moves ahead with Shot Spotter, but first, members of the public will have a chance to ask questions. ShotSpotter uses sensors to record sounds of suspected gunshots before sending alerts and locations to police. FitCog, a Portland police oversight group, recommended ShotSpotter to Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler last summer. Now city leaders are asking for any gunshot detection company to submit their proposals and then answer, question, answer questions from the public before Portland commits. Well, we want them to be very concise and, and clear about what, what they're proposing and how their technology works, but also addressing concerns that we um, you know, have heard all along.
Leaders have received about the effectiveness and value of ShotSpotter, according to public records requests that I've looked over. Mayor Wheeler's office did not answer my questions about why the city decided to change course or why it took four months to make this call. If a gunshot detection company is selected, the city plans to start a 12-month pilot program in March. David, Laurel. Thank you, Evan. Oregon has launched a new hotline aimed at giving people free legal advice related to reproductive rights. The project is driven by Oregon's Department of Justice and will be staffed by local law firms. Oregon's Attorney General said the Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade last year created confusion and fear even in a state where abortion rights are still protected.